sign up for the in-conference talks if you didn't do this. The sign up board is over there at the corner. Uh, we'll be glad to hear whatever you want to present. As Milko said, five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, you choose your slot depending on what's left. And now time to present to your attention, Mr. Bo Simonson, whom I got the pleasure to welcome in Bulgaria PHP. I've been to a lot of Bo's lectures uh, uh, on a lot of conference. Bo is a, uh, uh, he's a polyglot programmer since 1998. He hosts AstroCuts with a very <laughs> It was really cool tool for generating static uh, pages, which is uh, sometimes a very good optimization. <laughs> uh, and he's also an uh, open sourcer, um, helping other projects as well, like Stack PHP. Core committee member of the PHP FIG. Uh, without further ado, please, uh, Bo Simonson. Thank you. So this afternoon, we're going to be talking about the PHP FIG HTTP stack. If you want to learn more about PHP FIG, which is the framework, it's a framework, awesome, the framework interoperability group, there's going to be a panel on that this afternoon. So if you'd like to learn more in general about the FIG, definitely join for that. Uh, but this talk is specifically going to be about the HTTP stack. And about, I don't know, eight or ten years ago, somewhere around there, when Composer was sort of becoming a thing, people started to publish a lot more packages. And people started to share packages and use other packages, uh, which was actually pretty awesome. Uh, but one of the side effects of that was that occasionally we would end up with uh, kind of like infrastructure level things that needed to be shared. Uh, so for example, a geocoder package was actually gonna talk to a geo geocoder API. And in order to do so, it needed to do something with an HTTP client. Um, so since this HTTP client was needed, and there were several packages that actually provided this sort of functionality, people would have to write a bunch of adapters and ship those adapters with the projects themselves. This started to become a maintenance nightmare for people writing packages. All of a sudden now somebody's new HTTP client application, uh, or P PHP HTTP client uh, package would need to have an adapter written for anybody that wanted to consume it. So a real need started to arise for sort of a shared um, language, if you will, for dealing with HTTP API, or, uh, HTTP API consumption. So Benjamin Aberly decided to uh, do something about this and propose to PHP FIG the idea of having a standardized HTTP client interface. The interface itself was relatively simple at the time. There was no constructor sort of defined or anything like that. The only thing that was really there for the interface uh, was the, the request method. And the request method at the time took the method, the URL, some headers, and some content. So how you created the client was kind of up to you, uh, but everybody could assume that this sort of uh, function uh, would work as you expect. A bunch of people got interested in this and started to discuss the design behind this interface. One of them was someone uh, by the name of Chris Wall Smith. And his idea when he looked at this was to step back and start with some interfaces for more like the primitives of the request and the response rather than focusing on the HTTP client. That shifted the discussion for this HTTP client to making a much simpler interface, uh, which was send request with a request, and then you get a response back. So the community really liked that direction. So they decided to go ahead and go through with that and start trying to figure out uh, how we could do um, an interface like this. One of the problems, though, was that if you now have a client that can consume a request and return a response, you need to have some sort of way to create those requests and responses. So what we uh, talked about doing was creating a factory method of some sort that would also be a part of the spec that would provide a way for the client to give people a way to make a uh, request, and then the client could construct the response however it wanted. During this whole process, a bunch of things came up. For example, um, Benjamin Aberly said, hey, I forgot about cookies. How are we going to handle cookies with this? And another person in the community, Everett Potts, said, you know, if you're looking at this problem from the perspective of all the things that HTTP can do, 
you're going to have some problems because you're going to keep forgetting things. You're going to forget cookies. You're going to forget time to live on some obscure header. Um, that's not the way that this is going to work the best. So what he proposed was to focus on the primitive aspects of HTTP request and response. For the request, the HTTP method itself, the URL, the version, uh, the headers, and then a stream for a body, a stream uh, instance for the body. And for responses, to focus just on HTTP status code, the human readable status, HTTP version, headers, and the stream for our body. And by doing so, this, allowed, this would allow people to build whatever they need to around these. So if you need to handle cookies, well, cookies deal with a header. So you can actually implement headers however you want, or implement cookies however you want to by looking at these primitive um, interfaces that were provided for the requests and the response. So Fig went around to uh, start modeling HTTP. And this is where we ended up with PSR7. PSR7 is focusing just on, originally, the request and response of the client. In order to send the request and response, this would be all we would actually need to do in order to uh, create this hypothetical uh, standardized HTTP client that could consume a request and return a response. So if you look at PSR7, the, the, original uh, the original goal was just to handle the request and response for making client requests over HTTP. But in this process, people started to look at what we were building for the request and response and started to wonder if we could actually use these same interfaces for the client side as, or for the server side as well. The way that PHP works is that it consumes, PHP itself, the engine, consumes raw HTTP requests and responses. It then converts those into superglobals, essentially, that then are consumed by the PHP application itself. So these are things like servers and cookies and get and the things that generally people don't use these days or people get frowned on for using them these days. But behind the scenes, everybody was still actually using them. If you look at Symfony's HTTP foundation, they actually were creating uh, their own interface or their own uh, representation of HTTP requests um, using essentially these little bits from the HTTP primitives that, that PHP was getting. And in fact, it had a way to create a new request instance from those superglobals. So even though Symfony was actually using the superglobals, they were sort of hiding those from, the, from everybody else. Other implementations were doing the same thing. Zend, for example, had its own way to create its HTTP request uh, representation based on superglobals. So if you look at how modern PHP web applications were built, there's usually a framework involved, and usually there's some sort of front controller. And it's the front controller's job to convert the raw primitives that come from the SAPI, so the server um, superglobal, for example, and then create a request that can be consumed by something like a controller. And that controller is actually going to be using the information um, in the request object now. It's no longer dealing with the superglobals, but it's actually using the request object. So once PSR7 got a little further along and the request and response objects were getting a little more mature, uh, we, FIG was actually able to provide the same sort of functionality to convert the superglobals in PHP into a PSR7 request object. Um, there's actually a, a server request object that is used in this case, but fundamentally it's the same thing. It's the same set of interfaces with just a few extra bits on it um, to give us the same functionality that we had using the core underlying PSR7 request interface. So now we can see that PSR7 actually fills another role as well. It fulfills the role of handling the request and response objects between the front controller and uh, whatever your controller action is that's actually consuming those objects. The underlying idea here is that HTTP, HTTP messages are HTTP messages. So whether it's coming from a client or coming from a server, it's going to be exactly the same 
the, the language, the way that the messages are composed is exactly the same. So PSR 7 models that so that everybody is consuming things the way that you might expect. So if we put these pieces together, you get a better idea of how PSR 7 sort of fits into the entire process from client to process and then back to the client again. So it has a very specific role. So PSR 7 um, message, HTTP message interfaces came, uh, was finally uh, accepted as a proposal in May of 2015. Uh, there were a bunch of people that initially supported the PSR7 interfaces. I'm going to list some of them, but I, I know I'm missing some because I don't have them all. Uh, Guzzle was one of the big proponents of pushing PSR7. They implemented it all along throughout the spec to make sure that things would actually work. Uh, they were sort of the canonical client implementation. Uh, people like Guzzle is pretty popular. There are other client interfaces right now, but Guzzle is really one of the big big hitters. So them supporting and actually being able to use PSR7 was a big thing. The reference implementations that were built for PSR7 during the whole process uh, became a part of the Zend project. So Zend Diactros is the actual PSR7 implementation. Uh, there was a middleware implementation, we'll talk about middleware in a little bit, uh, called Zend Stratagility, and then they built a micro framework around PSR7 and Stratagility called Zend Expressive. The first big pre-existing framework to adopt PSR7 was Slim. Uh, Slim framework dro uh, adop adopted PSR7 pretty much immediately. Uh, the version that was current, or going to be current around that time, uh, they'd already made that decision to start using PSR7 as, as the base of uh, their most recent version. And finally, Symfony eventually built a bridge. And by eventually, I mean like five days later. Um, it was pretty awesome because with Symfony on board, that meant that anything that uses the Symfony HTTP kernel and Symfony's HTTP foundation would be able to consume and um, use PSR7 objects. So this meant that anything that uses Symfony, like Drupal, uh, could potentially use pieces that are built specifically for PSR7, even if they don't have anything at all to do with Drupal or anything like that. There were a couple of other groups that wanted to sort of push uh, this, this notion along about doing interoperability at the, at the HTTP layer. Uh, one of them was the PHP HTTP group, um, and another one was HTTP interop, and they both did a lot of work to try and bring these different pieces together. If you look for PSR7 on packages now, you're gonna find a lot of packages that, that actually start using this. So, uh, while some of the bigger frameworks that people might know, like Laravel, Symfony, um, they're, while they're not using PSR7, there are a lot of people who are act actively working uh, with PSR7 in the ecosystem right now. So the end result of this, of PSR7 anyway, uh, was the ability to create your API client. And you would get a client of some sort passed in, and then you would create a new request using an implementation. So here we have Guzzle PSR7 request, pass that to the client and then do something. So this was really useful except for the fact that we've now tied this API client to Guzzle. So we're gonna figure out how that's uh, solved in a little bit, but for a while this was actually uh, sort of a problem because it didn't really solve the main issue that um, was originally intended to uh, be addressed. On the server side, there was a lot of work being done with middleware. And the two bigger um, implementations that people standardized on were either called double, um, were following something that called double pass HTTP middleware, where both the request and the response are passed into the middleware. Um, and then there was single pass, which just pass in the request. And by and large, most of the bigger projects decided to standardize on request and response. Um, part of that is because of the dependency issue, which we'll look at in a minute. Uh, but this is sort of where people went. People also were um, making the assumption that uh, middleware would be invocable. So most of the PSR7 um, middleware frameworks early on would accept any callable um, and just assume that it was gonna match the method signature. But most of them also provided a proper interface. Um, and they would call it middleware or something along those lines, um, which was kind of problematic because then each actual framework would accept either a callable, 
or an expressive middleware, or a slim middleware, or a relay middleware. This really kind of went against this whole idea of PSR7. And if it really, it really didn't make any difference now, whether it was Zend or Symfony or Slim or Expressive, you're gonna be tying into an ecosystem. So there were a lot of things that needed to be addressed on this. And what we needed to do was kind of finish completing the stack. Uh, PSR7 was on its own for two, uh, for two years. Um, and these standards were sort of starting to emerge. And part of the reason that, that PSR7 went on its own for so long was to, to let people try it out and see what they wanted to do with it. Also, this was intended. This was from uh, Chris Wall Smith's um, original recommendation. Uh, focus on the interfaces first of the primitives. So focus on the, the request and the response, and then we can go back and return to uh, working on a client. Which Fig did do, except that Fig decided to go after the server side first. Um, in May of 2017, the PSR 15 working group was formed, and they they, they decided to look at the server side, uh, the potential surface area of how much impact PSR 15 could have over a client was pretty big. Um, there were a lot of people building conflicting PSR 7 implementations for, um, server, um, for frameworks, server-side frameworks, so solving this first was a big deal. One of the biggest sticking points was choosing double pass over single pass. Well, which one are we actually going to use? And to illustrate why the double pass was sort of preferable in some cases um, was because otherwise, if you wanted to build a middleware, uh, like we have a chaos middleware here, which is kind of fun. Um, its job is to look at every request that comes in and one out of every 100 requests throw back a 404. In order to do that, I need to pass in, uh, so I need to return a response object. Here, I'm creating a new guzzle response. This now ties this specific middleware implementation to Guzzle. If we do a double pass middleware, which is what everybody was doing, um, you can just say return the response with a status. So this sort of uh, was the reason why people were focusing on this double pass because it solved the problem of dependencies. And I sort of had this discussion with um, a friend of mine on um, our podcast and I said, you know, you're gonna need the response. Um, I'd spent a lot of time with Stack PHP writing a bunch of middleware. I almost always needed a response. That's one of the big things that you do with the middleware is do something with the response. And Dave, in his usual way, was basically, mm, do you though? Are, are you really going to need it every time? And I, I sort of had this realization, like a real time, sitting there like, mm, you know, my, my specific use cases for middleware were very specific. They were, they were focused on authentication, authorization, um, and uh, signing requests, signing responses, that sort of thing, where I might want to return often early, so not actually pass it on to um, the other middleware or the actual handler. So I began to realize that forcing people to bring in these requests and response objects was maybe not uh, a requirement. Not all middleware are gonna require those things. I think the biggest thing, though, was this technical problem that you weren't really sure what state that response was in when you received it. You could make the assumption that it was a brand new, uh, brand new uh, instance of a response, but you don't really know. Maybe someone's already written to it, maybe it's in some inconsistent state. So just setting the status on it and returning it wasn't necessarily the right path either. So we kind of came back to the same problem as we had initially. We either need to pass the object to these middleware, uh, or pass the response object to the middleware, or we introduce factories. And factories was actually the decision the team made. Now the problem was we didn't want to do factories inside the middleware response, or inside the middleware um, and server handling uh, PSR. So we already had PSR 15 in place, and the decision was made to hold off on actually defining the factories until after PSR 15 was done, but to, def but to design PSR 15 with the assumption that the factories are gonna be created. So that allowed the PSR 15 work working group to make the decision to go with the single pass um, middleware implementation because 
it really does make more sense to just get a request and return a response, um, but with the understanding that the solution would come later uh, for how to create those responses. The working group decided to not use invoke for the main interface. Uh, instead, the working group decided to use process. Um, and process would accept a request and a handler for the next uh, thing in the chain, and then a return a response object. PSR 15 also included sort of the, the end point of the middleware chain. Um, the request handler interface is sort of uh, what you would expect to be more like a controller. This is the thing that happens at the end. This is the, the raw um, getting a, just a request and returning a response and there's no next. There's no nothing else that's gonna happen. So if we look at the, the server handler itself, it's, it takes in a request, gives back a response. The middleware component, if you're not really familiar with, with those, uh, sort of sits in front of these, and you can have multiple of these um, in line. And you have a couple of things that you can do at varying points. Um, at the entry point, you can have the option to pass, which just means go ahead and pass the request through um, to the next middleware or to the application itself. Uh, you have the option to mutate, so you could actually change the request some. Um, if you're doing like cookie encryption, for example, this would be where you would decrypt the cookies and set the, the unencrypted value on the request and pass that on. So everything on the right side of the middleware is dealing with unencrypted data in the cookies. You could also short circuit. Um, you could decide just up outright, I'm going to return right now. I'm gonna return a 404, I'm gonna return a 403, um, return whatever you want to do. Essentially, you don't have to uh, pass on to the next middleware in the chain. On the way back out, on the response side, you sort of have to have the, the same options as well. You can pass the response back. You don't have to do anything at all. Just pass back whatever uh, next returns for you. You could mutate it. Um, so cookie ex co encrypted cookie example here would be going to the response that, that has plain text cookies and then encrypt them and then set them on a, the response and pass the response back that way. Um, or you could replace it entirely. If for some reason um, you've inspected the request and the response and have decided that this response that I'm getting back I need to throw away, maybe a signature is invalid or something you need to return, uh, something different, you have that option here as well. So if we look at the picture that we had started drawing earlier, uh, where we can see PSR 15 fitting is at the end. So this is everything that's dealing with the, re the request and the response um, after the front controller has converted it. So as soon as PSR 17, or as soon as PSR 15 was uh, completed, um, another working group started working on PSR 17. PSR 17 was the HTTP factories PSR. And what that does is provide you a way to create the PSR 7 um, primitives. So we can create a response, we can create a server request. This is where uh, we were looking earlier at the, the framework side, um, at the front controller level, taking in the uh, super globals to generate a server request instance. Um, streams are actually kind of a sticking point for PSR7. Streams are kind of weird. Um, but there is a factory for creating them. This was one of the big things that could be considered inconsistent um, in the request and the response object. So being able to generate a brand new stream um, is something that's actually pretty important for dealing with PSR7 uh, primitives. URI factory is also something that is, is probably used quite a bit uh, because generating brand new URIs for either the client side or um, anywhere along the chain is something that could actually happen quite frequently. Uh, so being able to uh, have a way to generate a URI without uh, reverting to actually going into like Guzzle and creating a URI using Guzzle is quite useful. So if we go back to our um, API the right way client implementation, um, the thing that we can do now is instead of calling into Guzzle PSR7 request, um, is we can actually inject a request factory and ask the request factory to create a request. So now this API client, or API the right way, is no longer tied to Guzzle. It, it's tied to some 
uh, ambiguous client, um, but it doesn't actually have anything to do uh, with Guzzle directly. So now it becomes possible to ship this uh, without tying it to Guzzle's PSR7 implementation or Zen's PSR7 implementation or so on. If we look at our Chaos middleware, uh, the single pass version, rather than returning the, the Guzzle response, uh, we can now inject the response factory into the, into the middleware's constructor and return a um, response factory and then create response with the status code. So this middleware now is completely agnostic to which PSR7 implementation uh, the application is actually using. So if we look at our grand picture of everything, the client can use PSR17 to generate URLs, requests, things along those nature. The actual front controller can use PSR17 to generate the server request object from uh, the super globals that come from PHP. And on the client, or on the server side, we can use PSR17 to generate new responses, uh, generate URLs if we need to, generate streams, and so forth. Finally, back in about a year ago, just over a year ago, uh, PSR18 came to be. And this turned out to be the HTTP client. Uh, so after all of those years, what we ended up with was interface, client interface, send request, takes a request interface, and returns a response interface. And if we look at the original implementation that we sort of had in the middle of the first pass at creating the client, it's actually pretty close to what we had. It just took six years to get there. Um, send request with request interface and return a response interface. So API the right way, client, now we can sort of finalize this. We've already finished the middleware. The middleware actually works the way it's supposed to. Um, if we look at the API client itself, uh, what we can do is we can pass in a client. So we pass in the client interface now, and um, we do this client send request. That actually stays the same, which is awesome. Uh, but this now means that our API client is completely agnostic to the underlying uh, client implementation. So if you're using Guzzle, um, if you're using um, some other HTTP client implementation, you no longer have to worry about this. I think Symfony has their HTTP client now and they have a PSR18 adapter. Um, so if you're using Symfony, then you're able to use um, the PSR18 Symfony adapter to work with this application. So it doesn't matter anymore. You can ship this code and everybody can consume it. Well, not everybody, but most people are gonna be able to consume it uh, without having to force them to use your favorite HTTP client implementation. So this more or less finalizes our picture. Uh, we have the PSR um, 18 uh, actually working as the client now. So we have PSR 18 using PSR 7 primitives to make requests and responses. And we have PSR 15 on the server side uh, consuming and using PSR 7 requests and responses. And we have PSR 17 uh, sort of sprinkled everywhere, uh, helping us to create the PSR 7 requests and responses. So this actually covers the entire aspect of everything from creating a brand new client request to actually receiving that client response. Um, everything along there now is handled by PH, uh, PHP Fig's uh, HTTP stack. And the, the numbers are a, little, are a little confusing sometime, and it might be a little strange to uh, sort of remember which piece you need where, uh, but hopefully uh, this will help you better understand how those work together. So it took a little over six years and four PSRs, uh, but uh, what started with a um, simple pull request or suggestion for PHP fig um, actually became a reality. And it's been around, uh, the, the full stack has been a, um, available for over a year now, just over a year. Um, yeah, so if you would uh, like to give it a try, I'd totally recommend um, taking a look at any of the PSR7 frameworks. Um, there's a bunch of them out there. If you're working with anything like Swool, uh, Swool is another uh, 
uh, project I know that is leveraging, um, or a lot of the frameworks built around Swool are leveraging uh, PSR7. Um, ultimately, what I've been seeing is that most new projects are using something uh, from this HTTP stack. Uh, a lot of the larger legacy uh, projects like Symfony, um, they aren't. They have a really big uh, investment in their own HTTP uh, component. Um, anything built on uh, Symfony's HTTP component is probably going to stay that way. Uh, so, for example, Laravel is probably not going to switch to uh, the, the FIG stack at any time soon. But if you're looking at newer projects coming out, um, async projects, uh, anything that's really sort of, uh, I don't want to say cutting edge, but a lot of the people who are working on new things are looking at uh, the PHP FIG stack to sort of be um, a place to start because there's an ecosystem growing around it so that it's easier for people to try their code uh, by being able to look at the actual um, larger ecosystem that's already using the fig stack. So that's it for now. Um, I don't remember if we have time for questions. If not, I will be available um, up there afterwards to talk with people. Okay, uh, so does anyone have any questions? Okay. No? Oh. <laughs> All right, so uh, you mentioned the Swool. Yes. And do you know any other projects that, that are similar to Swool and using the PSR7? Um, I, I do not. I know that there are, a, uh, there's the Zen Swool integration on top. Uh, so there's Zen Expressive for Swool. Um, and there, I think it's I, IGIN or something. I can't remember. There's, there's another framework that's built from scratch that I believe is on top of Swool that uses PSR 15, 17, and PSR 7. So that looks to be like a full stack Swool backed PHP fig thing. I haven't actually used it. Um, but I have seen, um, uh, I think it's like there's the, the newer Buzz React client. For example, use PSR7. Um, it, it can't use PSR18 because PSR18, um, the way that it defines the actual uh, response interface, it doesn't work well with async. Uh, so there are people building stuff with React PHP, um, what's that, AM PHP. Um, and Swool and things like that. So I, a lot of the people that I see working on those sorts of projects have been looking at PSR7 mostly because of the immutability. Uh, makes it friendly for uh, long running processes and things like that. Okay, thanks. Yep. Uh, I have another one. Oh, sure. <laughs> Which implementation do you consider the best person? <laughs> I, I, can you plead the fifth anywhere other than in the US? <laughs> um, I know that uh, Zen Diactros is the reference implementation. Um, I know that Guzzle is used by a lot of people, so those two I think are pretty fair. I know that Slim has its own implementation as well. So there's a bunch of implementations. Um, I don't think it should, in theory it shouldn't matter which one you use. Uh, but I have run into cases where, um, like early on with Zendiactros, I ran into a case where something happened with one of the, the headers um, and it was doing something extra. So you, you may still run into edge cases with people building their uh, PSR7 interface based packages, um, kind of doing more than the spec says it should, um, or trying to account for edge cases in different ways. So you may not always be 100% compatible, but the idea is that it shouldn't matter. Anyone else have any questions? All right, well, thank you very much.